Copyright in these lectures is either owned by the ANU or a third party who has licensed the ANU to use it. Students may use the recording for personal study only. No lecture may be communicated online, copied or shared without the prior permission of the ANU. everyone. I hope you all had a good long weekend and that you're enjoying the current weather. It finally is starting to feel like summer, so I'm getting really excited. But I know that for you guys that also means that you have a lot of work on. So I hope the assignment is going well. Can I just remind anyone that has questions, please do send me emails. Uh, if there's something that I can incorporate into a workshop, I'll do so. If it's specific to your group, I'll suggest that you come and see me and we can work through it together, but try not to leave it to the last minute because it is a big assignment. You do have a lot of different things happening in it. You've got the quantitative analysis, you've got the qualitative adjustments to the quantitative analysis, which means they need to come after the initial quantitative setup. You have the introduction of asset classes, you have the write-up of the report, including presentation. So you've got a number of different uh, stages of the report and you don't want to be leaving that to the last week. Typically, it, it does come through in quality when you end up rushing because so much of it comes down to presentation and polish. Now, in the workshop tomorrow, I will be focusing on some additional quantitative questions that I have about the assignment. If I have time, I will also start to talk about the write-up. If I don't have time to get onto the write-up, then I'll talk about the write-up and presentation in the following week's workshop. It'll all come down to the type of questions I get. Uh, typically, I leave the write-up till last simply because that's what you guys will be doing last. Uh, but if there are a lot of questions about the write-up already, please ask me and I'll incorporate them into what we do tomorrow as well. So today is the last week of our alternative assets topic. And then what we do next week is we finish with a look at global investing and that sort of rounds out our look at the different asset classes and the type of qualitative decisions you might want to bring into the assignment. Then the last two weeks look at things like how to implement an investment, governance and sort of other considerations that are relevant to portfolio construction but don't sit nicely within the overall uh, framework of the process that you follow in asset allocation. Now, we have three different asset classes to do today. We've got hedge funds, private equity, and commodities. So obviously, three asset classes in one day means that the good news for you guys is we're going to talk about some of the really interesting considerations about these asset classes, but we're not going to go through them in a huge amount of depth. I wish we could. I love alternative asset classes. I find them very interesting. There are whole courses spent on them. We don't have the time in this one. So the good news is it means that the amount you'll need to learn is lessened. The bad news is it would be great to spend a week on each of these. But it means we've got a lot to cover, so I need to stay disciplined and I will not go off on any tangents. And I have put a lot of the detail that we're going to discuss in the slides, which hopefully will minimise the amount that you'll be writing down. And if you have any questions, ask me as we go. Okay, so we're going to look at the nature and role of these three final alternative asset classes and challenges involved with investing in them. Now, for hedge funds and private equity, one of the biggest issues is all about manager selection and asset, uh, access. And another issue is illiquidity, right? You've got, to pick, you've got to be able to pick a good manager, you've got to be able to invest in a good manager, and you've got to manage any Ill illiquidity associated with either a hedge fund or a private equity investment. Commodities is really different. Illiquidity is essentially, a lot of the time it's not an issue at all, particularly if you're going to invest not in a physical commodity, but in an ETF or a collateralized commodity futures fund. So illiquidity isn't a big issue in commodities. Manager selection and access is also not a big issue for most commodities because you're just, you're buying shares of an ETF. 
or investing in a CCF, which we'll go through later today. But with commodities, the big thing that we're going to focus on is for the past few decades, people have spoken about commodities as a source of exotic beta. Do you guys remember in week five, exotic beta has low correlation with traditional asset classes like equities, and what does it give as an upside? What's the benefit of an exotic beta investment? Sorry? Uh, it gives you diversification with low correlation with equities. So if it has low correlation and therefore diversification uh, potential, the CAPM says what about its return? Yeah, so all you should be getting, essentially, if you've got a low beta for an investment, you did learn exotic beta in week five, I know it's been a while. If you have a low beta, right, all you should be getting is that small beta times the market risk premium. But exotic beta opportunities give you a greater return than what the beta implies, right? So even though these assets are a good diversifier, they give you an upside, an additional benefit of returns, despite being able to diversify away the risk. Now, for decades, commodities has been seen as a sort of source of exotic beta. But what we're going to focus on when we look at commodities today is what we call a process of financialization of commodities and what that means for its returns. Because essentially, more and more, people are seeing commodities not just as a hedge, but as an investment, as a speculation. That's increasing the demand for long positions in commodities, and as a result, it's eroding their returns. So although it's been a very good uh, investment, it's been a good diversifier with high returns in the past, that actually might be running out of steam. And the question becomes, is commodities going to stay as good an investment in the future as what it was in the past? We don't answer it, time will tell, but it does seem like the good, the very high returns per diversifiable risk that commodities used to give is starting to decline. So let's start with hedge funds. Now, hedge funds are funny because we call them an asset class, but technically they're not. I mean, think about our other asset classes. They're end investments, right? Equity, bonds, commodities. Hedge funds are funds set up to invest in end assets. So they're not an asset class per se, but we treat them as an asset class for portfolio construction because that's consistent with what's done in industry. A superannuation fund is going to have a hedge fund bucket that they fill in the same way that they'll fill their property bucket, their commodities bucket, their equity, their fixed income, and so on. So because hedge funds are treated as if they are an asset class in industry, when it comes to asset allocation, we're going to treat them that way as well. The other thing that's difficult in terms of defining hedge funds is that in the same way alternatives encompasses such a large range of asset classes that you could really only define what they're not, hedge funds have such a wide range of strategies that it becomes very difficult to pin down their specific exposures and drivers. Right? Hedge funds are set up with very broad investment mandates. They can short sell, they can leverage, they can trade in derivatives. They have huge differences in the strategies they take in the cross-section. So we're going to look in a couple of slides about, uh, at definitions of all of these different hedge fund strategies. Now, the returns are going to be very different depending on the strategy that a hedge fund follows. So their strategies vary in the cross-section, and with different strategies come different exposures and drivers. And in addition, in particular for certain hedge fund strategies like global macro, they're not set up to do one thing. They're set up to exploit opportunities that arise at any given point of time and that change through time. Right? Sometimes you might be investing in equity of emerging markets. Sometimes you might be doing fixed income arbitrage in developed markets. As opportunities arise, the strategy evolves. So for some hedge funds, not only are they different to other hedge funds in the cross-section, but their exposures and drivers are different among a time series return of their own, right? What's an exposure for a hedge fund this year might not be an exposure for a hedge fund five years from now. So it does become quite hard to pin down their key exposures, which has also made it quite hard to figure out the separation of return from skill and return from risk. Okay, so 
uh, the way to think about hedge funds is a very flexible investment vehicle that could be doing a lot of different things and so they don't all behave in the same ways. But there is one thing that every hedge fund will aim to do and that's generate alpha. Right? That is the reason for their existence. If they weren't aiming to generate alpha, they would never be able to charge the high fees that they charge. Right? Because hedge funds aren't like mutual funds that just charge a management fee. They charge a management fee and a performance fee on top of that. You're never going to pay someone a management and a performance fee to just track a market index. Right? Because you can do that yourself. So remember that investment defini uh, sorry, that industry definition of alpha being something that you can't easily replicate on your own. This is the epitome of that view of alpha, because hedge funds are set up to, uh, to take advantage of the skill of a hedge fund manager and their ability to short sell, trade in derivatives and borrow to get alpha out of these investment strategies. Now whether the end investor gets that alpha is, a, is another issue, and I'll come to that in the next point. But before I move on to that, the other thing I wanted to say is they're set up to provide alpha. Arguably, they're also able to get rid of risk. But the reality is there's been some catastrophic hedge fund collapses. They are seen as quite a risky investment because they do have such a broad mandate. They don't disclose a lot of what they do. So because of that, they cater to what we call high net worth investors, right? Be they high net worth institutions or high net worth individuals. So not everyone can access a hedge fund. Now the argument behind that is that high net worth investors are more financially savvy. I think I probably mentioned last week, I don't buy that at all. I don't think because you're wealthier you are better with money. Some of the people I know that are very wealthy are the worst with money. But what it does mean is that if you are a multi-multi-millionaire, if you're a billionaire and you give a million dollars to a hedge fund manager and he loses it, it's not good but it's not horrific. If you're a mum and dad investor that have saved all their lives to get together a pot of money that they give to a hedge fund manager, that they give to long-term capital management, they're two Nobel Prize winners, and then they lose it all, that's catastrophic. Right? So the reason that hedge funds cater to these high net worth individuals and institutions, you might argue it's because they uh, understand the risks involved. I think more importantly, they're able to bear a loss better. So remember, not everyone can access a hedge fund. So if you're thinking about hedge funds in the assignment, have a look at the definition. I'll leave this for you guys to do. It's really easy to find how you define a high net worth individual institution. Just double check that your investors do meet that criteria before you invest in a hedge fund. I'm not saying they don't, but it's the type of thing you'd need to consider in the real world. Okay, so going back to this issue that it can be hard to separate what's luck uh, sorry, what's um, risk and what's skill in hedge funds, is whether hedge funds truly hedge like they claim. Right? The whole reason that hedge funds are called hedge funds is that they were set up to do exactly that. They were set up to produce alpha while hedging risk away. Now, there's a good argument as to why they can do that. Right? Why is it that a mutual fund, an equity mutual fund, will have difficulty hedging away market risk? but there's something that a hedge fund manager can do that would enable them to get rid of market risk. What is the difference that makes uh, hedging possible in a hedge fund? Shorts is one option, right? If you're long in the equity market by buying undervalued stocks, an equity mutual fund manager can only take those long positions. So yes, they're hopefully gonna get alpha by buying underpriced stocks, but they're still exposed to market movements. A hedge fund manager can also go short in stocks they think are overvalued. Now they can gain, if they're right, from shorting overvalued stocks. They can gain from buying undervalued stocks, but the beta in the short and long portfolios can cancel out, which will actually eliminate, theoretically, movement in the market. And I'll come to an example of that later on. If they don't short, what's the other thing they could do that would help them to get rid of market risk? hedging, right? They can also trade in derivatives, right? So that's two big things that they can do that a traditional manager can't that would theoretically mean that they could get rid of 
their market risk while keeping the alpha. And remember how we looked at portable alpha in week five? That was the key, being able to trade in derivatives. Because if you can trade in derivatives, you can hedge away the beta risk and keep the alpha. Now, it's a really good concept. In reality, most hedge fund managers do have market risk. And we're going to look at this in the next slide. See that orange bit in every bar? That is risk from beta factors. Some hedge funds will have equity market risk. Some hedge funds will have uh, risk in the fixed income market. Some will have a huge range of all these different risks that they haven't got rid of. So don't take the word hedge fund to mean they literally get rid of the risk, because in most cases it isn't the case. But the difficulty in actually showing how much risk a hedge manager will take on is that it's actually quite hard to define what the beta risks are for them because they can do so many different strategies. Right? Think about an equity mutual fund manager. Remember how we said that slowly through time, skill has been taken away from them as more and more people think it's actually risk. Right? So in the 40s, if my fund did better than your fund, it's because I am skilled. Then came the cap M, and it turns out I was taking on a portfolio with a beta of two, and your portfolio had a beta of one. So it makes sense that my return was higher than yours because I had more market risk. Fast forward to 93, and Farmer and French then identified the fact that it doesn't count as skill if you're profiting just from investing in small stocks or value stocks. And then in 97, Carhartt said, it's not skill if all you're doing is taking advantage of momentum in returns. So even in equity mutual funds, the sources of skill are diminishing through time. And in hedge funds, a similar process has occurred, but it's slower because hedge funds can be doing so many different things. So it's, it's actually quite difficult to pinpoint what the beta risk sources are. If you run something like the Carhartt model on a hedge fund, you'll get a very low R squared, and there will be very little of the return explained by the Carhartt four factors. But that doesn't mean that they're not taking on market risk and getting compensated for it. It reflects the fact that not only can they invest in equities, but they can also invest in other asset classes. Not only can they go long, but they can also go short. They can invest in derivatives. So what's happened with hedge funds is more and more factor models have been created. And I don't expect you guys to know them, but one of the most popular is some academics called Fung and Shea have a seven factor, a nine factor, and I think a 12 factor model for hedge funds. But the seven factor one is quite popular. There is two equity factors, two bond factors, and three different derivatives, right, on bonds, on currencies, and on commodities. Even with all seven factors, the R squares are still pretty low. So it seems like a lot is alpha, but the view is, over time, as we get better at pinning down what the hedge fund exposures are, that alpha is going to shrink further, and more and more will be realized is skill, sorry, is risk, rather than skill. So I'll come back to this slide because I'm not quite finished, but see this orange? This is a beta return. The idea is more and more that orange is going to expand and the blue, which is what the investors get as alpha, is going to shrink through time. Uh, the fact, though, that hedge fund managers should be skilled is reflected in their fee structure. They get the management fee and the performance fee. Can anyone remember from last week, what's the average management fee now in hedge funds? 1.5. It used to be 2. It's coming down over time. Performance fee? 20%. Right, so a 20% performance fee means that for every dollar they, they produce above a high watermark, and I'll show you the specifics of the high watermark later on, but for every dollar that they add in net asset value, they get to keep 20 cents of that, leaving only 80 cents for the investors, and that can actually add up to quite a bit over time, particularly since it's not risk adjusted. Right? They get 20% of the profits, but there's no risk adjustment factor in that. It's just 20% of every additional dollar earned above a high watermark. So there's a lot of issues over whether hedge fund managers are actually paid too much and what's actually being left for the investors to benefit from. Now, to give you an example of that, this is the ABCs of hedge funds paper from which I took those beta factors to show you the hedge fund backfill in last week's workshop. Right? Remember how in the, in the workshop last week, 
We have our annual returns for hedge funds going back into the uh, late 1980s, but the quarterly returns only started in 2000. So what we did is we took the actual yearly returns and then we figured out how to split that yearly return across the four quarters in each year by calculating return based on an equity beta, a bond beta, and a cash beta. Those betas were taken from this paper here, and specifically, they're the equally weighted betas of stocks, bonds, and cash. Okay, so remember, the first thing to realize is that what we have here is different hedge fund strategies, and I'm going to go through each of these strategies in the next couple of slides. For each strategy, the authors took the average total, uh, the average return, raw return, from that strategy, and that's the full bar for each. Then they took the total return being produced by these hedge funds, and they split it up. The black is the amount of that return that managers keep as fees. The orange is the amount of that return that is attributable to risk, right, to beta, and that's only using three beta factors, equity, bonds, and cash. Remember, Fung and Shea have a seven-factor model. So with more beta that's identified, that orange bar will expand, and what it's going to shrink out is not the black, but the blue. The blue is the alpha left over to investors, and the more return that's attributable to beta means the less return left as alpha, right? The actual risk-adjusted excess return. So there's a few things to notice here. The first is pretty much across the board, and I'll come back to dedicated short later on. Pretty much across the board, there is a very large proportion of the returns that actually is due to risk, right? The orange is over a third in every, almost every strategy. Okay, so the first thing is clearly these hedge funds are not just hedging away all available risk exposures. The second thing is that yes, on average, end investors are getting alpha. You'd hope so because they're paying a lot of fees to the manager. And yes, all right, they're getting alpha in the blue there. But often the alpha that they get in the blue is actually less than the hedge fund manager is taking in fees. So hedge fund managers on average are benefiting more than the people giving them the money to invest, which comes back to why people are, are, are arguing about whether hedge fund managers are actually getting paid too much. So you can see that hedge funds of that return, hedge fund managers are getting about 3% plus pretty much across the board. Okay, so you've got a lot of different strategies here and they're all gonna have different exposures and drivers. If we go through them, we're gonna start with this convertible arbitrage strategy and then work our way along. You might have done convert, uh, convertible arbitrage in something like investments, perhaps. By the way, I don't expect you guys to know these in any more detail than what we have here and what we're discussing, but I just want you to be aware of the differences in strategies that exist. There are others, but these are the big ones. So convertible arbitrage exploits mispricing between convertible bonds and the shares that underlie those convertible bonds. So it's a long, short strategy. And typically what happens is you go long in a convertible bond that will give you the ability to convert that bond into stock at a predetermined time and at a predetermined price. So you're going long, you're purchasing the convertible bond, and at the same time, you're shorting the underlying stock. The idea is that usually the conversion ratio that you can uh, convert the bonds to shares is at a discount to market price. So the idea is that you're short selling for a higher amount than what you will convert the bonds to stock in order to close out the short sale, and the difference is profit. It's called arbitrage, it's not arbitrage, there is risk involved, but remember how I said that people in finance love to call things arbitrage that isn't arbitrage because there is risk? Hedge funds are probably the biggest offenders of this. Most of the time when you see them refer to arbitrage, it's not arbitrage because they have to wait for convergence and it's not a sure thing. So that's a long short strategy. Now, the reason I uh, often refer to whether it's long or long short is remember, hedge funds can do these strategies by shorting, by leveraging, and by trading in derivatives. So it's uh, different strategies will be taking advantage of different forms of flexibility. Emerging market strategies invest in maybe the equity, maybe the fixed income, maybe both of emerging markets. It's usually long only, at least for now, 
That's because emerging markets don't yet have a very developed derivatives market, and they typically don't allow a lot of short selling. So it's just an area where what is easy to invest in is a long position. Now, equity market neutral, I'll go through a step-by-step -step example with numbers in a couple of slides. But essentially what you're doing is you're exploiting mispricing on both the over and the undervalued side. Right, so you're finding stocks that are undervalued and you're buying those stocks, same as an active mutual fund manager. But in addition, you're finding stocks that are overvalued and you're short selling the overvalued stocks as well. And the amount that you have invested in long and short positions equal. So essentially, the way that you can afford to go into your long positions is by raising the money from your short positions. Providing both portfolios have a roughly equal beta, that should get rid of your equity risk, which is why it's called equity market neutral. Right? Because if you've got a long and a short portfolio, if the market goes up, then from that rise, your long portfolio will go up, but your short portfolio will go down to offset it. And if the market falls, you'll lose on your long portfolio, but you'll gain in your short portfolio. And again, the two will offset. So that all, is, all that's left is whether you're correct and your undervalued stocks go up, so you profit, and your overvalued stocks go down, so you profit on that too. So if done well, equity market neutral should have very little equity beta risk. There's event-driven strategies, so this is all um, about trading because of a particular company event. So merger arbitrage, can anyone remember from corporate finance? Who tends to benefit more from a merger, a bidder or a target? A target, right? Okay, so what happens with merger arbitrage is you try to benefit from the fact that on average, target shareholders gain from a merger. So what you do is you try to identify which companies will become targets in the future. You purchase stock in that company before it happens, and then you are a shareholder of the target when it becomes a takeover target, and you benefit from the successful completion of the takeover. It is called merger arbitrage. What's the problem with calling it arbitrage? Risk, right? Mergers are not sure things. Even if it's already announced, it might fall through. But certainly, if you're attempting to pick a target before it happens, it's not a guarantee that it will be a target. And if it is a target, it's not a guarantee that the merger will be successful. Not to mention that every so often targets do lose in a merger. So if they call it arbitrage, it's not. Uh, but a good merger arbitrager will, arbitrager will make a lot of money from it. Typically long only because all you're doing is purchasing the shares in the target. So in that case, the way that you're raising the money is borrowing rather than taking short positions. A fixed income arbitrage is going to exploit relative mispricing of fixed income securities and often on both the long and short sides. So if you think back to what we did at the end of the fixed income week, when we looked at things like relative spread focus and yield curve positioning, all of those strategies might be done within a fixed income arbitrage fund. Global macro is that one I told you is really hard to pin down because the strategies will vary in the cross section, even within global macro funds, and they're gonna vary across time, right? Essentially, this is a purely opportunistic strategy. You're trying to find whatever markets are hot at the time, and you're trying to take advantage of that. So you might be long in whichever securities you think are undervalued in particular markets that you think are undervalued, and short in the reverse. And in a lot of cases, what you're doing is you're looking at macroeconomic variables. You're looking at changes in interest rates, foreign exchange rates, trying to take advantage of illiquidity premiums, and you're typically both going long and short. Now, long-short equity is very mu much like equity market neutral. The only difference is that in a long-short equity strategy, you have more long positions than you do short. Remember, in an equity market neutral strategy, the way you got rid of equity risk is by having an equal amount in your long and your short portfolio and with equal betas. In a long-short equity, you might have, say, a 150-50 fund, in which case, if you're collecting 100 million from investors, you might have 150 million in long positions in stocks you think are undervalued and 50 million in short positions that you think are overvalued, leaving a 100 million net long exposure to the equity market. 
So if you're looking at the equity beta of an equity market neutral fund versus a long short equity fund, which one do you think will have a higher equity beta? Long short equity, right? And, and you're going to see evidence of that in a couple of slides. Uh, managed futures are going to trade in futures on anything that will have futures on, right? You know how many different assets have derivatives traded on them. It might be currencies, it might be fixed income, it might be commodities. Something like a collateralized commodity futures fund that we're going to look at at the end of today is an example of a long only strategy, but you might be taking long short strategies as well. And dedicated short funds are the opposite of long only funds. In other words, all you do in a dedicated short fund is take short positions. You don't purchase, you only short sell. So if you're a dedicated short equity fund, you're only short selling stocks, so you're aiming to profit from market downturns, right? Because if the market goes down and you're short, your portfolio will go up. A dedicated short bias fund is the reverse of a long short equity fund. Right. In a long short equity fund, you had more long than you did short. In a dedicated short bias fund, you have more short than you do long. So the reason, I wanted to take you through all of those for two reasons. One is to realize just how um, widespread the different strategies are, which helps to understand why it's so hard to figure out the exposures and drivers in a hedge fund. But the other reason is that we talk a lot about how you have lots of different beta sources in hedge funds and we still don't know how many beta sources we should have and what they should be. With each of these different strategies, different funds are going to be exposed to different forms of risk, which is why with hedge funds we have seven or nine or 12 factor models because we're trying to figure out a range of risk factors that won't necessarily be needed for every, like one hedge fund might only have a high loading on three factors but we're trying to find factor models that will actually help to explain the huge range of hedge fund strategies that are out there. And to show you how that works, you can actually see the strategies reflected in these three beta factors from the ABCs of hedge funds paper, right? So what we're doing here is see this orange bar? That is a combination of the returns using a beta on equities, bonds, and cash. Here are those actual betas from the different strategies. So if you have a look, say, at emerging market equities, you can see they have a positive exposure to bonds, uh, sorry, positive exposure to stocks, because they're investing in emerging market stocks. And remember how I said it was a long-only strategy. So the way they raise the money to take on their long positions is by borrowing, right? This is using leverage as a form of hedge fund flexibility which is why they have a negative exposure to the bond market. I'll come to cash in a moment at the end. Equity market neutral, they should be, uh, remember they don't borrow, they raise money from short selling equities and they use that money to then purchase undervalued equities. And if they have the same amount long and short and their two portfolios have similar betas, they should get rid of equity market risk. And that's what you see here. They've essentially neutralized the equity market risk. The beta is only 0.08. And they're not investing in or shorting bonds. So they also don't have a, a beta on the bond market. They do have a beta in cash, and I'll come back to that. Uh, and then driven something like merger arbitrage, where you borrow money to buy stocks that you think will be targets. So it's not a widespread strategy, but uh, and if you do it well, you shouldn't have a huge amount of stock-specific risk. Uh, sorry, you shouldn't have a huge amount of equity market risk, but every, stocks are still exposed to the equity market. They're stocks, right? So you are going to have some equity market beta involved. What else? Global macro, it's pretty hard to pin down what they're doing. Long-short equity, remember, unlike equity market neutral, Long short equity has a net long exposure to the equity market. And you can see that by the fact that they do have a positive equity beta. And we also know that they raise some of their money from short selling, but the rest of it from borrowing. So it makes sense that they have a negative beta to the bond market. And dedicated short, remember they are only shorting the equity market. So that's why they have a very strong beta, but it's negative. Right, when the market goes up, dedicated short funds do poorly. When the market goes down, dedicated short does well. Which is why we've got this negative beta sitting here. Now the other thing 
is that they all have a beta to cash that's fairly close to one. Can anyone tell me why that is? What do hedge funds do in terms of a cash investment? Collateral. Hedge funds don't use the money given to them by investors. They don't have to because they can short sell, they can trade in derivatives, they can borrow. So what they do, and I'll show you an example in the next slide, is they take their money from investors and then they invest it in something like a cash investment and it will sit there to be used as collateral. They then raise the money for their long strategies by shorting, by borrowing, by or they might not need the money if they trade in derivatives. So they raise their, uh, the money that they go long through shorting or leverage. And the money from investors is still sitting there in a cash account. Which is why, even though the stocks and the bond betas can be very different depending on the strategy, most of them have a beta that is very close to one. And you can actually see that in this example of the difference between an equity market neutral strategy and a long short equity strategy. Just to, and this is going to be important when we look at commodities as well, because collateralized commodity futures funds do the same thing. They take the money from investors and they sit that in a cash account as collateral. Now, obviously, these numbers are made up and they're constructed such that the two strategies have the same net assets from investors and they have the same leverage. But what leverage ratio? But what it does is show where the money comes from. All right, so we have a non directional fund, right? The returns aren't dependent on market direction. So, an equity market neutral fund is a good example and a directional fund that will still have exposure to market movements, and so a long-short equity fund is a good example. Both funds, let's talk about millions, both funds receive 100 million in net assets from their investors. They both take that $100 million and they invest it in cash to act as collateral. Right, so the money they actually get from their investors, they're doing the exact same thing with. They're putting it in cash. Now, we've cre uh, this is it created so that both funds have a leverage ratio of four. And the way we calculate leverage for hedge funds is we sum all of their positions together, their longs and their shorts, and we divide it by their net assets. So how many positions are they leveraging off the net assets that they get from investors? If we start with the equity market neutral fund, they are going to purchase $200 million in uh, stocks that they think are undervalued, right? So their long portfolio is $200 million. And the way they raise that $200 million is by going short in $200 million of positions for stocks they think are overvalued, right? So they raise the money from the short sale and then they use that to invest in their long portfolio. Providing their right when their longs go up in value, they profit. When their shorts go down in value, they profit. And providing that they have equal betas on the long and the short portfolios, they will cancel out their equity market risk. Because if you ignore the mispricing side, when the market goes up, all the long stocks will move up with it just because of that market risk. But the short stocks will go down. And when the market falls, it will take the long position down with it because of market risk but the short position will benefit. So the two are cancelling, and all that's left is ideally the profit made by the long undervalued and short overvalued stocks. Is everyone happy with that? Any questions? So when we come down to the non-directional return, the return on that strategy is the return on the cash rate for the 100 million used as collateral, plus the return on the long short portfolio. And if, if you do it well, you'll have a return in both the long and the short sides of the trade. Then you have the directional fund. Again, they get $100 million from investors, they put it in cash. We've created it so they're going to also have a leverage ratio of four. But in this case, they're going to invest $300 million in long positions and $100 million in short to get the $400 million at long plus short positions. So in other words, $100 million they're going to raise by short selling stocks they think are overvalued. They're going to put that $100 million into purchasing stocks they think are undervalued. And then they're going to put another $200 million in stocks they think are undervalued. And the way they'll fund that other $200 million is by borrowing the difference. 
Great, so they'll raise money 100 million from shorting, 200 billion from leverage. Which means when it comes to their return, you'll have the return on cash, plus the return on the long short portfolio, less the interest on borrowing. Now, in a long short equity fund, because you have more long than you do short, it is directional, right? Even if the two portfolios have equal betas, you're gonna have more invested long than you do short. So when the market goes up, even if the average stock in your long position went up by the same amount that the average stock in your short position went down, you've got more going up than you do going down, so you gain. And when the market drops, you've got more dropping on your long side than you do going up on your short side, and you lose. But the reason I keep going back to these betas is that often people will assume that by definition, equity market neutral strategies will neutralize market risk. But if you don't have equal betas in the two portfolios, you're not gonna be able to do that. Right? Let's say that you have a beta in your long portfolio of two and a beta in your short portfolio of one. If, a, if the market goes up by 10%, your long port portfolio might go up by 20%, and your short portfolio will only go down by 10%. So you'll end up gaining. But if the market drops by 20, uh, sorry, if the market drops by 10%, your long portfolio will go down by 20, right? Because the beta is two. And your short portfolio will only go up by 10 because the beta is only one, right? So to actually neutralize the equity market risk in a non-directional fund, you need the beta in your long position to equal the beta in your short. Any questions on that? So the, uh, yeah, so the question is um, essentially, are you am I right? The question is, are you defining long short versus equity neutral by the, it's not by the betas, it's by the positions, right? And that's correct. So um, even if there is a beta mismatch, if you have equal amounts long and short, it still sits within the equity market neutral category, but it's a misnomer. Like it, they, they'll call it equity market neutral because you have similar dollars in your long and short positions, but you're not actually neutralizing equity market risk. If it's a long short equity, we're not talking about the betas that define it, we're talking about the fact that you have more dollars long than you do short. Any other questions? Okay. So I wanted to finish hedge funds just by raising a couple of other features about them that are either, I think, interesting or things that you need to watch out for. Um, the first thing to consider, this is just, I wanted to flag this just to remind anyone that wasn't in the workshop last week to actually go and listen to the recording because one of the things that we can do with hedge funds, because we have a long yearly time series, we can take advantage of that to backfill our shorter quarterly time series. Right, so remember, and I said this earlier, what we did is we took our yearly returns and we backfilled the quarterly data Rather than, so that rather than starting in 2000, we could start it in the, at the end of the 1980s. And the way we did that is modeling hedge fund returns, and this is only a simple example. Remember, there are seven factor models and nine factor models and so on. But we just used the betas in the ABCs of hedge funds paper from the graph earlier. And we said hedge fund return is the beta on cash times the cash return, plus the beta on equity times the equity return, plus the beta on bonds times the bond return. And then if you didn't have the yearly data, you would add expected alpha and subtract expected fees. We didn't need to do that. And the reason is that the yearly data is inclusive of alpha and fees. So we didn't need to worry about adding on alpha and subtracting fees because it was already contained in the return data history for yearly. So all we needed to do is use the beta um, times the cash return, the beta times the equity return, and the beta times the bond return. So if you weren't at the workshop, have a look at the recording. If you're using yearly returns, you don't need to worry about backfilling hedge funds. But if you're using quarterly returns in the assignment, it's much better to backfill one asset class than lose a decade of data from all of the others, particularly when you have the safety of knowing what the yearly hedge fund returns are. Right, backfilling is, backfilling is dangerous when you've got nothing to guide you. But when you know what the yearly data is, 
all you're figuring out is an approximate split between the quarters, which makes it a lot less prone to error. It won't be perfect, but it's better than nothing. Another thing that's quite cool about hedge funds, but it does make it really important to understand that things like a normal distribution will be violated, is that they have nonlinear payoffs. Right? Remember, with a normal distribution, you don't have things like skewness. With hedge funds, there are three, there are two reasons that will mean it has a nonlinear payoff structure, and a third reason that means that the nonlinear payoff structure will be amplified. In other words, first of all, hedge funds can invest in derivatives, and in particular, they can invest in options. We know that options do not have linear payoffs, right? If you're long in a call option, you will gain with rises in the spot price, but you won't lose in terms of payoffs if the spot price falls below the strike price, right? It's non-linear. So first of all, the strategies can have non-linear payoffs. The second thing is that leverage doesn't create non-linear payoffs on its own, but it does amplify whatever payoffs you have, right? With leverage, if you're gaining, you'll gain more. If you lose, you'll lose more. If you have a non-linear payoff structure, it will be stronger. Everything is amplified with leverage. So if a fund both invests in options and borrows, that non-linearity will be even more extreme. But the third is the reason why even if there's no leverage, and even if they don't invest in things like options, hedge funds will always have a non-linear payoff structure to their end investors. Right? The first two will often happen, but not always. The third will always happen. And that's because all hedge funds have this dual structure of both a management and a performance fee. And the performance fee is essentially like a free option to the manager. So that's what you can see in the graphs here. And it actually does create risk-taking implications that mean that managers and the end investor can be misaligned. Don't worry about the right-hand side. Just focus on the left-hand side for the time being. What happens with a performance fee in a hedge fund is that the hedge fund manager is going to get a slice of the profits, 20% of every dollar produced by the hedge fund. Now, there's two conditions before that kicks in. The first is what we call a hurdle rate. In other words, hedge funds will set a particular hurdle rate that they first need to meet before they get a performance fee. Right? And that's to acknowledge the fact that we shouldn't really be impressed if they grow the fund by 1% return. Right, because, I mean, the market's probably doing better than that. Right, so first of all, they need to do better than a hurdle rate. And this is explained in your readings, by the way. Providing that they do better than the hurdle rate, which is the minimum return before which you can, you can potentially get a performance fee. Providing they do that, they will get a dollar for every, sorry, they will get 20% of every dollar and above the high watermark. Now, what a high watermark is, is the, the highest past net asset value for the fund after you adjust for fund in and outflows. The reason we call it a high watermark is think about it as essentially the mark left by the retreating tide in the ocean, right? You need to go further before you can actually say that you've grown the fund by more than it was before. The reason that a high watermark is important is let's say there wasn't a high watermark there. A hedge fund manager comes in, they do really well, they grow the fund, the fund has a 20% return uh, over three years. And then they leave and a new manager comes in and destroys the fund's value, it goes down by half. But then after a few years, they kind of start to figure out what they're doing. They've lost half of the fund's value, but then in the next year, they get a 3% return, positive. They grow the fund by 3%. But the fund is still 50% down on what it was when they first came in, right? They shouldn't be rewarded for making back a little bit of the money they have lost for investors. So it's only when they end up making investors better off than where they were before that they should start to get performance fees. Does that make sense? So the high watermark is there to protect investors and avoid a risk of a manager destroying value and then just getting a little bit of it back, but the investor is still worse off overall. All right, so let's assume that the manager has met the hurdle rate and the high water marks in play. 
If the value of the fund, the net asset value of the fund, and by the way, this is adjusting for in and out flows, right? The fund will grow if more investors give it money, but that doesn't count as performance. That's just more money coming into the fund. So we adjust for that. If the value of the fund is lower than the high watermark, there's no performance fee. But there's also no penalty, right? They're not giving money back to investors to compensate. They're just getting a 0% performance fee. If the net asset value gets above the high watermark, then for every dollar, the manager is taking a slice. On average, they're taking 20%, so 20 cents to each dollar. So for every extra dollar, they're getting 20 cents. Now think about risk-taking incentives. Would a manager be more likely to take a risky strategy if, the high, if they're sitting here on the right of the high watermark or if they're sitting down here on the left of the high water mark. Where would they be likely to take a strategy with higher risk? Left, right? Because think about it. You're sitting down here. You're not getting a performance fee already. If you take on a safe strategy, then you are 100% guaranteed that you will not get a performance fee, right? Because you're not gonna have a high enough return. If you take on a risky strategy, there is a small chance that you will improve performance to the point that you get a performance fee by gaining a, uh, to a point that's above the high water mark. There is also a very decent chance that you will lose money, which just means you're still below the net asset at the high water mark, so you're still not getting a performance fee. You're already not getting a performance fee. Worst case scenario, you still don't get a performance fee. So you don't have the downside risk. But the investors do, because you're losing their money. Right? If the net asset value is going from here to here, that is money being taken out of investors' pockets. It's destroying their return. But it's not affecting the compensation of the fund manager. Now, there's still risk. right? You don't, uh, the risk, essentially, is that you'll lose your investors, or if it's really bad, go bankrupt. But it means that a manager is much more likely to take on a risky strategy sitting here than up here, where they have the same amount to lose as the investor, right? Because for every dollar they lose, that's gonna be a, a lower performance fee for them in the same way that it's gonna be a lower return for the investor. So performance fees are created to align the interests of managers and investors, and to a large part they do, but it only works well when there is a performance fee to be gained. The issue is that they're not getting penalized. It's, not, it's a long call. It's not a long futures or forward. They're not getting penalized as the fund goes down in value. I guess, the, as, I, the, as I said, the only penalty is essentially that they will lose investors and potentially go bankrupt. But there's a lot that can, you have to go really, really wrong before that happens and investors have lost value in the meantime. So because of that, you will have a non-linear payoff structure irrespective of whether you're investing in options or leveraging. Now the other thing, and it again comes back to this idea that hedge fund managers are paid a lot of money, is once you incorporate the management fee, it's not, this is like a long call option. Once you've got the management fee, it's like a long call option where you receive both premium and profit. Right, you're not shifting it down, you're shifting it up. Right, so, if the manager loses money for investors, they're still getting their management fee. They're not getting a performance fee, but they're still getting a cut of the fund. So that's just, it's a really interesting, it's so hard to create an incentive contract that will align the interests of different parties in lots of different states of the world. Right? We can move towards more efficient contracts, but there's always gonna be caveats that means that conflicts of interest are gonna arise. You might say, why not punish the manager by giving them a linear payoff structure? But I don't know how many people would want to continue to be hedge fund managers if they were going to have to give investors money back on top of all the dollars that they were losing. OK, so some other aspects of hedge funds that it's important to consider. And you don't need to necessarily mention all of these in your assignment, but it's important to be aware of them. Right? If you're going to recommend an asset class, don't just be aware of its strengths be aware of its weaknesses as well. So one of them is issues with manager selection. We said this last week, with hedge funds, past data is unreliable. One, there is only a short history, particularly at quarterly intervals. 
but more importantly, two, there's selection bias, because hedge fund managers are not forced to report their returns. So remember, typically what happens is the best performers will always report their returns, the poor performers have an incentive not to. So the proportion of good performers that report is higher than the proportion of poor performers that report returns. So when it comes to the data that you guys are using in your assignment, the hedge fund index data, which is the average data of all the hedge funds that are reporting returns in a database, it will be upwardly biased above the true performance figures. Right? The, the figures, the performance or the returns that you see in the data are typically going to be inflated relative to the true returns, which you can't observe because the poor performers aren't always reporting. So because of that, because you know that hedge fund data is biased, and because even with a single hedge fund, you'll have periods where they report and then periods when they don't, and you don't know whether the reason they're not reporting is that these are the periods they're not doing well, and you don't know how poorly they're doing or why, it's not enough just to look at the data. Right? It's really important to dig deeper than that and understand the hedge fund itself, and every hedge fund will be different. Right? So have a look at the people and therefore the skill in the fund. A hedge fund has no value on its own. It's not like gold that has inherent value. A hedge fund is only as good as the strategies the manager follows. Right, so if the manager is skillful, the hedge fund will be profitable on average. Right? There is luck involved too. But if the manager is not skillful, there's no reason why that hedge fund will continue to do well through time. Okay, so have a look at the track records of the manager. That might be looking at their hedge fund record, but often you can actually go back and look at their mutual fund record as well. Because what often happens is that the best mutual fund managers don't stay mutual fund managers. Right? Why would you? You're just getting a management fee. If you want to get the real money, you move off and start at your own hedge fund where you get the performance fee as well. Right? Because good uh, hedge fund managers make a lot more money than good mutual fund managers. So they trade on their name and they start a hedge fund instead. So go back and look at their history when they were a mutual fund manager. Get an idea of their strategies. Get an idea of their skill. When it comes to their strategy, they won't always give you a lot of information, but they'll give you often enough to start thinking in terms of the rationale and the capacity. Now remember, capacity is how much money you can make um, for a given amount of money thrown into a strategy. If a strategy has low capacity, then if you invest a lot of money into it, the profits will be eroded through price impact. And that's exactly what we looked at in the mid-semester exam question where there was a conflict of interest as the fund gets bigger between managers and their end investors. Particularly in the case in the mid-semester exam, remember it was a small cap manager and therefore it wasn't a particularly liquid market. Right? So the less liquid the asset class, typically the lower the capacity in the strategy. So if you have a hedge fund manager that's investing in frontier emerging market small capitalization stocks and they're a very big fund, you might start to wonder whether even if they've had good returns in the past, it might not be able to continue into the future. Because as they get bigger, the price impact would increase and the ability to profit would therefore go down. Look at their access and, and terms and whether they suit you. So have a look at their lockup periods. Have a look at their redemption windows. It might be that the best hedge fund manager out there is running a fund with a three-year lockup period Right, so once you put your money in, you can't get it out for the first three years. And only annual redemption windows, so even after the money's been there for three years, you can only pull out your money at one point of time in each year. Right, and let's face it, chances are when you're going to need the money is not going to be a day before the next redemption window. Now, that's fine if you're a long-term investor, but if you know that you might need that money within the next three years, or if you know you might need that money with a short notice period, they might be the best hedge fund manager in the world, but their terms might not be suited to you. So it's also about a match between you and the manager. And the other thing is that you need to remember that there is significant operations risk when it comes to a hedge fund, more so than in a mutual fund because disclosure is lower. Now, I'll go through this in a lot of detail in the next slide because I'm going to look at seven different dimensions of risk. So let me come back to that in a moment because I don't want to miss out on the last point here and I'll probably get distracted and forget. So consider operations risk, which I'll talk about in a moment. 
But the other thing that it's important to remember when it comes to recommending a hedge fund investment, it might be for your assignment, it might be when you're in the industry, is you can also decide, am I going to recommend a hedge fund or am I going to recommend a fund of hedge funds? Now, fund of hedge funds are quite big in this area. They're big in private equity and in hedge funds. And the idea is that the fund of hedge fund manager has skill in selecting the right hedge fund managers and can access them because of their size. The real downside of the fund of hedge fund manager is the dual layer of dual fees, right? The hedge funds are going to have a 1.5 management and a 20% performance fee. The fund of hedge fund manager is going to have a 1% management and a 10% performance fee over the top. So they are expensive. But the good fund of hedge fund managers do create value. The other issue, and this actually isn't a drawback of the fund of hedge funds, it's a drawback of the data, is that when you look at the historical performance on average of fund of hedge funds versus the historical performance of the actual hedge fund universe, it looks like hedge funds on average do a lot better than the fund of hedge funds. And on the surface, you might think, well, that's just because they charge high fees. But it's not actually that simple. Think about the optional disclosure part. If you're a hedge fund, you can decide whether to report your returns. Now, that doesn't mean you decide whether to report some or all of your returns for a given month, right? If you are going to report your return, you report your overall return. You can't just report your return for Telstra and not BHP, right? You've got to report your return in general. So you decide, do I report or don't I? Now, the fund of hedge fund manager, it's the same thing. Do I report or don't I? So let's say you're a fund of hedge fund manager. You have done well. You've got a portfolio of eight different hedge funds. Of those eight hedge funds, six have done very well. Two have done poorly. They've had negative returns. Now, overall, your performance is still positive, right? Because the six good ones were great. But when you report, you still have the drag on your total return of the two poor performers. So the data item that's recorded reflects the six good and the two bad funds. In the individual hedge fund universe, chances are those six hedge funds that were good also reported their returns. But the two that weren't might have chosen not to report. So when you look at the data in the individual hedge fund universe, you might have the good performers, but not the poor performers. Whereas in the fund of hedge fund universe, if they report, they report the return of every fund that they've invested in. So they have the poor along with the good, which means it creates more of an upward bias at the hedge fund individual level than it does at the fund of hedge fund level. Right? The fund of hedge fund might still choose not to report returns, but that would be if they have more poor performers than they do good performance typically, right? Whereas the individual hedge fund, you're either good or you're not, you decide or you don't. So don't look at a negative relative performance in fund of hedge funds as an average of the overall asset or investment vehicle and assume they're worse than hedge funds because a lot of it could actually be coming from the reporting bias of what you're choosing to report. Does that make sense? It's so often, you know, people will so quickly say fund of hedge funds are not worth it, they charge a dual layer of fees, and therefore, on average, they underperform. But it's actually this reporting issue as well. Now, if we go back to operations risk, this is actually quite a common cause of hedge fund failures. And it's essentially intentional or unintentional failures in the way that the fund is run, right? It might be fraud, it might be a genuine mistake. But it's, we classify it as potential failures in a fund's systems, its people, or its processes. Right? That might be trade processing, it might be accounting errors, issues with the administration, issues in valuation, issues in reporting. And a good example of that is Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. Right? Now, this is very intentional. This was absolute fraud. But can anyone tell me what happens in a Ponzi scheme? So let me start off. All right, so I'm a hedge fund manager. I'm going to raise money from everyone on the far left, of my far left, right? So I'm going to get money from you guys, and I promise you a great return. Then I'm going to take another tranche, and I'm going to get money, not borrow. You guys will give me money as a hedge fund manager in this next strip here. So I take your money, and I turn around, and I give it to you. And that's your great return. So I promised you a good return. You've got a great return. 
So you're happy, you're wealthy, you have a bunch of wealthy friends. And you're going to tell them how good I am. So you're going to tell your friends who are going to say in this third tranche, all right, I want a cut of this, you're going to give me your money. And I'm going to say thank you very much and I'm going to turn around and I'm going to give it to you guys. So I've now got more people that are really happy with the great returns I've been giving them. So you tell your friends, I get money from you, I give it to you guys. I take money from you, I give it to you guys here. And then I get to the end and I've got these poor people on my right. And there's no one left to get more money from to give back to you. There's no inherent value created in a Ponzi scheme. By definition, it will crash in the end. And what happens essentially is I have, I run out of people to pass the money down to. And it's the end, the last investors in a Ponzi scheme that are hurt the most. Okay, that is operations risk. And it is more likely to occur in a hedge fund because reporting is more opaque. And although, yes, so yes, it might be accidental, but it might actually be something like a Ponzi scheme where it's actually the manager committing fraud and taking advantage of a lot of investors. Right, so can you see with things like this why it is important to make sure that hedge funds cater to high net worth individuals and institutions? Right, you need people to either be able to understand the risks or bear the losses if they do occur. Now, I actually, I like this breakdown of seven different dimensions of hedge fund risk because it does talk, it, it starts to talk about what lies beneath, right? It's not just standard deviation. It's all of the different things that are happening in a hedge fund and how that can create risk for the investor. So this is um, from Casey Quirk and BNY Mellon. There are other ways to define it, but I think this is a nice breakdown because it gets you thinking about what a hedge fund's doing. Right, the first one is the surface risk, and that is the risk of uh, your portfolio going down, right, for performance. But within hedge funds, you also have liquidity risk. Now that might be a risk in taking a haircut or a perm on the underlying assets, or it might, remember, be the fact that you have redemption restrictions. So redemption windows, you have gates, and that can make it harder to get your money out of a hedge fund. You have counterparty risk, so that's the risk of a broker failing or cutting off financing. That happened to a lot of hedge funds in the GFC when Lehman Brothers collapsed, and since then, hedge funds have started to diversify their counterparty risk, right? They don't rely on one counterparty like they used to. They spread it between a number of different ones. We've done operations risk. There's financing risk. Remember, a lot of hedge funds rely on leverage to execute their strategies. So financing risk is a risk that you can't borrow or you can, but only at really bad or high interest rates. There's co-investor risk, right? Let's say I'm really happy with my hedge fund manager and you guys all have money with him as well, or her. I'm happy, I don't want to pull my money out, but for some reason, and it might be completely disconnected with the performance of my manager, you decide to pull out your money. Maybe you need the liquidity. Some of you pull out your money, which means that the manager needs to liquidate investment strategies before they're ready, right? Perhaps that they haven't created enough redemption restrictions. So they liquidate assets before the strategy was ready to pay off, so the performance goes down. So more of you are unhappy and you ask for your money back. So they liquidate more strategies and the performance goes down. And more of you start to pull out your money as well. And I was happy with my manager. I didn't want to remove my money, so I didn't pull it out. And suddenly my value's gone down, not because the manager was bad, but because a bunch of the co-investors in the fund decided to take their money away. And the seventh is key man and talent risk, right? Remember I said the hedge fund is only as good as the manager that runs it. It might be that the manager moves to a different hedge fund and the new one isn't as good. It might be that they decide to expand into new strategies and they're not as skilled in these new strategies as they were in the old. It might be that they retire. It's morbid, but it might be that they die, right? I mean, if any of this stuff is possible, it's a real risk, but you don't see it in the standard deviation of returns. And you don't necessarily see it just by looking at a hedge fund name. You've got to dig deeper, say, who is the manager? Are they going to remain in the hedge fund? Because if they don't, the next person might not be as skillful. Okay, so that's hedge funds. Let's take a short break and we'll come back at a quarter past three and we'll do private equity and commodities. We're going to look at those in less detail. A lot of private uh, hedge fund issues apply to private equity as well. And commodities, it's, we're only really looking at one aspect, which is financialization.
All right, so next is private equity. Now, we've actually looked at private equity a bit last week in particular, where when we introduced alternative assets, uh, we gave private equity as the example in a lot of cases when we talked about their features. And private equity does have similarities with hedge funds as well through things like uh, the dual fee structure, the fact that the key challenges are manager selection and access. But what I wanted to do now in talking about private equity is just to talk about a couple of the different main, uh, the key parts of a, or types of private equity investment, how they're structured. And the big thing I wanted to talk about is the differences and similarities between public and private equity. Because private equity has a lot of challenges. It's illiquid. It's really important that you pick the right manager. It's long term. So for private equity to be worthwhile, it needs to give you something different than your public equity investment. It needs to be able to diversify your public equity investment or give you a big boost to your return, right? Because otherwise, you're just taking on more equity risk, but with added challenges that you need to overcome. So we'll talk about ways in which public and private equity differ, which keeps it as a useful diversifier, even though technically they're equity in both cases. Right, the fact that it's private versus public does mean that it has very different exposures in a lot of circumstances. So let's start by talking about the different subsectors of private equity. The biggest one by quite a way is the leveraged buyout sector. Right? So here what you're doing is you're taking a public company and you're purchasing all of its shares and therefore moving it and changing it to a private company instead. You're delisting it from the exchange. That's going to be very expensive, so you're going to borrow a large amount in order to do that, and you'll use the firm's assets as collateral for the loan. Right? It's a big part of the private equity market, and the performance on average of leveraged buyouts has been stronger than the next bit, which is venture capital. Right? On average, in the US, most of the private equity studies are done in the US. Uh, it does seem that LBOs do create value. Now, venture capital is the financing of startup companies, right? So you have someone that has an idea, it's untried, it's untested, it is probably not even fully developed into an actual product. So it can't go to the banks because there's nothing to provide as collateral. It can't raise money in the public markets because why would public equity shareholders give these venture capitalists money for something that they have no control over and no idea as to whether or not it will be successful. What they do instead is they seek financing from a venture capitalist. The venture capitalist comes in, gives them a large amount of funding, and in return it takes a large amount of control in how that idea is executed, right, in creating the product and in taking it to market. So, I mean, some of the biggest success stories out there were started by venture capital. Uber, Instagram, Genentech, Cisco Systems, I think Microsoft was also venture capital. Right, the big success stories make a huge amount of money. The trouble with venture capitalists is that you never hear about that idea that's in some kid's backyard that never makes it to fruition, right? You never really hear about some of the failures. And what you see is you have a very large, or at least what we know, it's hard to observe, but we have a very large proportion of failures and a few big success stories, which means the, uh, the venture capital distribution is highly skewed and the average is actually negative in the US. It depends on the study, but the majority of studies show that what you have is big success stories, a negative average performance, and a very large proportion of failures. Mezzanine financing is the, the smallest of the three. We don't focus on it in this course. It's essentially dealing in, in hybrids, right? So you might be investing in convertible debt or convertible preference shares. You might have warrants. It's all about investing in one way, uh, but using that, uh, having that investment such that you convert it into another. So you might lend, but with warrants that can change it to equity, so you can take advantage of the equity upside once you uh, have more confidence that the idea will be good. But we don't really focus on that third category of this. In terms of a few things to be aware of for how private equity is structured, the first is that they're limited partnerships. So you have 
a bunch of different limited partners, they're your end investors. So if you recommend that Abigail or Robert invest in private equity, they will be limited partners. They give their money to a general partner. The general partner pulls the money together and it's the general partner that actually goes and executes and oversees and manages the private equity investments and distributes the money back to the limited partners. It's a closed end investment and typically the fund will have a life of about 10 years with extension options of a few more. And we refer to um, each private equity fund or each closed end investment as a vintage, right? So if I'm a general partner, I might raise money and close my fund to do investment this year, at which point I'm going to start going and investing in private companies. This fund would be a 2018 vintage. Then in four years from now, I might start up a new fund that I'll run in parallel. I'll raise money in 2022, which I will close off and start investing from 2022 on. That fund will be a 2022 year vintage. Okay, so the vintage refers to the year in which the money was raised and the fund was closed. What we mean by closed end investment is that the manager will start by going through a period of fundraising from investors. Managers know the size of the fund they're going to target. They'll then raise that money from investors and once they've got that amount of money, they close the fund, they don't want any more. They don't want to deal with trying to solicit more money, they just want to know they have what they need to execute their private equity strategy. And if in the future they think that there's more money to be made, they might raise a new vintage. But once a private equity fund is closed and then goes, apart, goes about executing its investments, if you want to get into that fund, you'll need to do so in the secondaries market by buying shares in that private equity fund from someone else that was already an owner in the fund or a limited partner in the fund. But what that also means is that if you're unhappy in your private equity fund or if you suddenly need to liquidate because you have demands on your cash, you need to sell it in the secondary market. And remember, we've said uh, last week as well as in prior, prior weeks, the issue with that is that the private equity secondaries market is not liquid. So you tend to have to sell it at a discount to the fund's net asset value. The other thing we referred to last week is that when it comes to a private equity investment, there's uncertainty about when you'll give money in and when you'll get money back. So let's say that I am a general partner and I raise $500 million from you guys as a private equity fund. I close it and from today I'm going to start looking for private equity investments. You guys don't give me the $500 million now. You have to hang on to it until I find my investment. Because if you give it to me now, I'm going to have to what, put it in cash and that's going to have a low return and that's going to drag down my performance. I don't want it till I know I can put it to good use. You guys can deal with how to invest it in the meantime. So what happens is I start to look for private equity investments and let's say at the start of December, I find the first private equity company that I want to invest in. And I might call up 100 million of the 500 million from you and I'll use that to fund my first investment. Then six months from now, I might call up another 75 million. And then three months from that, I might call up another 50. I won't ask for the money until I know what I'm going to do with it which means that you don't know how much is going to be called and when it's going to be called. You know that eventually you'll be giving me $500 million, but you don't know the timing of that. And then once I make my private equity investments, after many years have passed, I'm going to start to execute, uh, sorry, to exit the investments, right? Because these are long-term strategies. If this is a venture capital strategy, it might take eight years before the product is ready, created, has got a good customer base, and it's ready to exit via an IPO, right? So what will tend to happen is maybe six years into the fund, you'll start to get some cash flow back, and that's going to keep going while the fund exits its different investments, but you still don't know when you're going to get money back and how big that money is going to be. You hope that at the end you'll have more money than how you started, but you don't have control over the timing. I've already said there is a secondaries market, but it's not liquid. Like hedge funds, there are fund of funds in private equity. You again have a double layer of fees. 
Now, good private equity managers do make good money. Remember how we said that in private equity, manager access and manager selection is critical because the top quartile of private equity managers do have persistent outperformance. Right, so if they do well, chances are they'll raise a new fund that also does well. This is a, an area where it's really important to have specialized skills. But for ordinary investors, it might be hard for us to figure out which the good managers are, and even if we do, it might be hard to persuade them to give us, uh, to persuade them to accept our money, because remember they favor, favor big clients, existing clients, and high name clients. So instead, you give your money to a fund of fund manager that pulls the money together and is of a, a particular size to be attractive to the private equity funds and has experience and expertise in picking the managers. And they might have had investments in those private equity companies already. And the other thing is when it comes to talking about return in private equity, we use different language. Rather than looking at things like alpha, typically they talk about internal rate of return. What's internal rate of return? It's the rate of return that what? Makes NPV zero, right? So internal rate of return is a return that would create a zero NPV, and you'll want that return to be higher than a hurdle rate. There's return on invested capital, that's ROI. Very simple, it's cash that you uh, get back over cash that you put in, and there's no adjustment for risk. And we also talk about a J curve in private equity. Now a J-curve is reflecting the process of giving money to the fund and getting that money back. Right? When you first um, commit capital to a private equity fund, you're going to have a lot of years where you are giving them money but not receiving anything in return. Right? So remember how I said I'm going to ask for 100 million, then another 75, then another 50. So if you think about a graph that is money out and then money back, for the first few years, you are you're giving them money, you're not getting a return. Then after, say, five years, you might start to get a bit back. You'll get a bit more back and a bit more back. So now you're going to start getting more money back, and you'll hit a point that would be a U, where you have got back the same amount as what you put in. The reason it's called a J-curve is you obviously want to be better off than how you started. So what happened is it's a J. So you put money in, then you start to get money back, and it keeps going, and you want to end up with more money back than the money than what you, your starting position, right? So that's why it's a J, not a U curve. You're going to be better off at the end of the cycle. But again, it doesn't control for risk. So one of the issues with private equity is industry met metrics are usually not risk adjusted. Internal rate of return is, but only to a point. Whereas academic metrics are risk adjusted but the industry argues they might not be as appropriate given the nature of the investment. So there is a disagreement between academia and industry on how private equity funds perform, and it's because they're using different metrics. Ah, perfect. Which is exactly what I have here. So there, there is debate on whether private equity is gonna outperform the market after fees. That's partly because academia versus industry use different methods, right? Industry uses internal rate of return, they also use things like public market equivalents. So a public market equivalent return, is you know how I said you've got the J-curve in private equity? What you do is you take the money that you gave to the private equity manager in terms of size and timing, and you say, all right, well, if I put that exact amount of money into the public equity market, what would I get back at the end? And how does that compare to the fact that I put it with a private equity manager instead? Academia likes to use things like the CAPM and other factor models, and obviously different uh, performance metrics are going to result in different outcomes. Industry tends to argue that the CAPM isn't appropriate because the benchmark is a public equity market, and there are a lot of differences between the two. Uh, but in t if you take all of the findings together, it does seem like leverage buyouts on average outperform even once you take away their fees. The studies, they tend to be based in the US and actually most LBOs. If you're going to invest in private equity, they're often domiciled in the US or the UK. There are Australian private equity funds, but the market's a lot smaller here. Venture capital funds, as I said, on average, performance is poor, but you have big, big success stories. You also have far more failures and they often don't get reported. <laughs> 
There is evidence of performance persistent in the top quartile. In other words, if a manager raises a private equity fund and that private equity fund performs in the top quartile of the universe, the chances are strong that the next fund they raise will also be good. So once you've identified a good private equity manager, they tend to stay good managers because they're quite sticky. You tend to start up, you'll start up a private equity fund, either you or with a small group, and you don't tend to have a lot of movement between the different funds. So as long as the general partners are the same people, confidence is higher that they'll continue to do well, but you've got to be able to access as well as find those good managers. So remember how I said last week, private equity is one of those areas that if you can't pick or access the good managers, you're better off not investing in private equity because otherwise the average performer is more likely to erode your returns than add to it. Any questions? So that takes us to the important thing in terms of a multi-asset class fund, which is all right, private equity has challenges. Does it also have opportunities? And does it also have diversification potential compared to our public equities? Because we know public equities tends to be our biggest weight. So we need to know, is it going to help us diversify that risk? And we need to know whether it's going to add the potential for performance as well. Now, we've said that top quartile private equity managers do outperform after fees. So the other part of that question is, does it also diversify your equity risk? Now, there are linkages between private and public equities that limit the amount to which it can diversify your public equity risk. The first is that firms are firms and customers are customers. And no matter what, at the end of the day, you will therefore be exposed to the economy and its effect on company profits. Right? I mean, if we're in a recession and people are starting to rein in their spending, it doesn't matter whether you're publicly listed like Nike or privately listed like Warner Jane. If people are going to be spending less on the goods that you produce, that's going to happen in the private and the public equity market. And the other thing that, would, that creates a link between public and private equity is that when you exit a private equity investment, which is how you make your money back, you often do so through exiting in the public domain. Does anyone know what I'm talking about here? What is the key way to, what is a very common way to exit a private equity investment? IPO, right? If you're going to exit an investment through taking the company public through an IPO, you are exiting in the public equity market. So if the public equity market is performing poorly and investors are not willing to spend a lot of money, that's going to affect your IPO in the same way it's affecting um, already listed stocks. But there are also a lot of differences that do help to decouple the return correlations between the two. Uh, the first is that volatility in private equity is higher. Right? That might be directly through things like LBOs. You've got high debt to equity ra ratios, often double, like a two times debt to equity ratio. But it's also because things like venture capitalists are riskier. Right? So you've got a higher vo uh, volatility, not just because you have a higher leverage, but you have a greater uncertainty in your returns. Uh, there's differences in corporate governance structure. Right? In private equity, the general partner has a lot more control over how the investment's executed, whereas in public equity, you've got a wide dispersion of ownership, so any one owner has less control over the company direction. And if you're just a normal minority stakeholder, you've got no control over the day-to-day -day direction of the company. Right? All you can do in public equities is vote when allowed at the annual general meeting, um, at the uh, board of director elections, for example. Uh, the third is that private equity is one of those ones where there's scope for economic value at. Remember, we said that last week. Right? In private equity, the general partner is taking the, the actual actions that is adding value to the business. Right? They might be refreshing the asset portfolio. They might be changing the incentive structure of management in how they're compensated. They might be repositioning the company finances so it can better borrow more um, additional financing at more attractive rates. Right? The general partner is making the changes that is resulting in added value. Whereas in a public equity investment, remember even the most skillful active manager 
is going to buy uh, shares in a stock and wait. And they don't have that same amount of control over the value going up. They just hope that the market realises their mistake. Sourcing of assets is another big advantage to private equity. Right? We all know that in public equity, insider trading is bad. Or at least I hope we all know that. Right? In public equity markets, you cannot trade on inside information because you are taking advantage of public investors. In private equity, there isn't that restriction because you're not listed on the public domain. Right? Private equity is one of those areas where you want inside knowledge. You can invest on it. You can take advantage of it because you're not disadvantaging ordinary investors. Right? So insider information is good in private equity, whereas in public equity, you at least, should, even if you have it, you shouldn't be trading on it. And we're going to look more at that in our last week. Uh, on the downside, private equity is more illiquid than public equity, and it is a longer term investment in that it's hard to get out early. And it is also more expensive, right? You've got both management and performance fees. And also, it costs a lot more to actually go through a public, uh, sorry, a private equity investment be it getting a product that's a venture capital idea and creating it and taking it to market, or actually taking an, existingly, an existing public company and bringing it private. Right? You've got legal costs, you've got administrative costs, it's more time consuming. So it is a more expensive form of investment. Right? But these differences do actually reduce the correlations between them, which means that it is, uh, private equity is a good diversifier for your public equities. It's not the perfect diversifier, but it does have diversification potential. Any questions? So that gets us to commodities. Now, commodities, you don't have a lot of the issues that exist for most alternative assets. It's not hard to find a manager. Often they're available via ETFs. It's therefore also not hard to access them. If they're listed, they're not illiquid, right? All right, the physical commodity might be illiquid, but most, in most cases now in commodities, you can trade not the physical commodity, but the ETF on the physical commodity, which makes it easy to transact. The issue with commodities is although it's been a very good investment in the past, it doesn't mean that a strong return for low risk would continue into the future, because it might be that while it was a source of exotic beta, it's run out of steam, and that good opportunity is starting to diminish, partly because of the sheer force of demand. Right? As more and more people invest in commodities, the ability to earn excess returns is declining through time. Now, we're going to talk a lot about why that is, but before we do, to sort of get us an idea of where the commodity market is now and how it's grown over time, the biggest thing to realize is that several decades ago, we didn't think of commodities as an investment. In the same way that until uh, far more recently, we didn't think of art as an investment, right? Commodities is something that you traded. It's something that uh, you might be a producer of or a consumer of, but it wasn't an investment on its own. That changed with what we call the financialization of commodities, in that we started to realize that they actually were a valuable investment rather than just a need for consumption or a production good. Now, the reason that it did get such large inflows is that it has a lot of, it has the qualities of exotic beta. It looks good from both a return and a risk perspective. From a return perspective, commodities on average have returns that are about on par with equities, right? Our high return asset class. Now, commodity risk on its own is high as well, but the correlation between equities and commodities is low. So in other words, here's an asset class where we can diversify the risk away by combining it with equities or significantly diminish its risk, but it's still giving us a high return, right? The definition of exotic beta. It's also because it's real assets seen as providing an inflation hedge. Now remember, equities and fixed income, our nominal assets do badly in times of inflation. So this is an asset that one, diversifies equity risk, two, gives us a good return, and three, helps to protect us against inflation. So when the purchasing power of our dollar is going down, commodities is giving a stronger return to compensate. Right, so that's a very pretty picture. And you combine that with the huge growth in China and other bits of Asia, 
and you've seen big inflows into commodity markets over the past few decades. Now, if you're going to invest in commodities, you can do so in two ways, and they do have different implications for returns. The first is that you can invest in the physical commodity. Now, that might be actually going and buying and storing the physical commodity, or it might be investing in an ETF. The latter is much more popular, particularly with things like gold. Right? Gold is good in that it doesn't erode or tarnish or fade, but it's heavy and it's annoying to transport and you've got to put it somewhere. So rather than every person in this room going out and buying a few gold bars, it's a lot easier for an ETF to buy gold bars for all of us, store it in the one warehouse, and we're just going to purchase shares of the ETF. Right, so gold, which is a popular um, commodity partly because it's a safe haven, is also now easier to invest in thanks to the ETF market. On top of that, if you think about things like um, wheat or wool, yes, you've still got to store it like you've got to store gold, but they might mould or erode with time. So it becomes even more difficult to deal with the physical good. A lot easier to say that's the manager of the ETF's problem, I'm just going to buy the ETF. But either way, the return will be pretty similar because the return is going to be the return on the physical commodity, right? So it's spot price at the end divided by the spot price at the beginning minus one. And from that, you're going to subtract storage and other costs. Now, if you invest in the physical commodity, then you are actually subtracting the storage costs because you're paying for the storage. But if you invest in the ETF, you still pay storage costs. It's just that you pay it through management fees. Right? Management will select a fee that will cover the storage cost and have a bit extra for the convenience that they provide you. The alternative is that you could invest in collateralized commodity futures funds. Now, CCS, take your money and place it in collateral and then they purchase commodity futures. And they purchase long positions. Remember, they purchase long positions because we are investing in the asset class. So we're purchasing the asset class or taking a long position in the futures. Now, in this case, the return is the return on the collateral, right? Because they, you, they take your money and invest it in cash as collateral, plus the return on the futures investment. And if we um, assume a physical settlement, that would be the end spot price less the locked-in beginning futures price divided by the spot price at the start of the period. So the two things that you have happening here that you wouldn't have in the physical commodities is the influences on the futures price, which I'm going to get to in a moment, and the return on the collateral. Now, the important thing about CCS that I want to talk about now before we move into the theory of normal backwardation is not only are we taking long positions, but in those long positions, we are speculators, not hedges. Why are we speculators, not hedges in commodities as investors that are doing portfolio construction? Uh, what cor correlated in what way? Our investment is correlated with the market in a way a hedges wouldn't be. Uh, but why? So uh, to, be a to be a hedger, what does it imply about your portfolio? That you already have an asset, right? So then you're hedging. Then, so that's why speculators do have the correlation with the market that hedgers don't. Um, but the key thing is that if you're a hedger, you have an asset of which you need to hedge its risk. Whereas we are not investing to hedge away a risk. We are investing to gain an exposure to commodities. Right, we want an exposure, we're speculators, we're not hedges. Okay, so that's going to be really important when we understand why the financialization of commodities is actually reducing its future profitability. But before we do that, let me just show you some numbers that uh, demonstrate why commodities have had good returns so far. Start with the top box. If you look at the return of commodities, these are CCFs, they're almost as high as stocks. Now, the risk is high as well, but if you have a look at the correlation of commodities with stocks and bonds, it's negative, slightly negative in both cases. So now you've got a, an asset that gives you a good return while also being able to diversify away the risk of bonds and, more importantly, equities. 
because equities are the big risk driver in most multi-asset class portfolios. On top of that, remember I said it sought, uh, thought to provide an inflation hedge, while stocks and bonds have negative correlations with inflation, which is a double whammy, right? Because stocks and bonds tend to do worse as inflation goes up. And on top of that, not only are they doing worse, but they're doing worse at a time where the purchasing power of your goods is being eroded as well. Whereas commodities have a positive correlation with expected and uninspected inflation, which gives them an infl the inflation hedge property. So these are sort of the reasons why we've been saying that they are a great source of exotic beta. In our final slide, though, I'll show you how those returns are going down over time. This fact is in the beta, and it looks at the multi-asset class portfolio level. What we have here is a portfolio, a multi-asset class portfolio that doesn't include commodities, and two portfolios, each of which have a 10% exposure to commodities. They're just two different indices, right? One is the Dow Jones AIG, that, by the way, that's now the Bloomberg Commodity Index, and the other is the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, which is our biggest. What you can see is the second you add in commodities to the portfolio, the return is pretty much the same, but the risk is substantially lower at the total portfolio level. Right? So you can see the commodity diversification in action, and it's happening without sacrificing expected return. In terms of the factors that are going to determine the future's price, you know the first one, we don't focus on that in this course, right? That's just a theory of storage, right? If you want an investment in commodities, you could either go long in the futures on the left, or you could purchase the underlying commodity, store it for a while, incur interest because you've borrowed to buy it, and then they subtract this thing called the convenience yield, which is essentially by the, it, what the convenience yield says is if you own the commodity before you need it, you could get an advantage from that, right? Maybe you could lease it to someone else, or maybe it can plug a shortfall in your other inventory. We don't focus about on that. You've done that in prior courses. What we focus on is Keynes's theory of normal backwardation. Now, like the theory of storage, this comes from the 30s, but it's still in use today. And the reason it's so valuable to understand commodities is it brings in the influence of supply and demand. What Keynes says is that the commodities futures price is a function of the spot price that we expect the commodity to be at at the time the future matures, plus what we call this risk premium that's negative in a backwardation market and positive in a contango market. Now, to understand what that means, a backwardation market is what we are typically in. Contango markets are rare. What Keynes said is that there are more hedges than speculators in a commodities market. Now, if the expected future spot price is above the future's locked-in price, the market is what we call normal backwardation, and this is what typically will occur. Now, remember, there are a lot more hedges than speculators. The hedges on average are producers of the commodities. So to hedge, they want to take a short position in the commodities. Investors, speculators, would therefore take the long position. Now there are more people needing to go short than there are willing to go long. So what those hedging producers say is they come to the, the speculators and say, I want you to take the long position to my short position in the futures contract, right? The speculators in the long position are locking in a price to pay the hedges. Speculators want to pay a low price. Hedges would like to receive a high price, but hedges need to get rid of their risk. So what they do is they say, all right, you speculators go long and I'll go short. And in return, I will reduce the futures price that you need to pay me below what we expect a spot price to be at the time. That way, I get to get rid of my risk and you get to lock in a price that's lower than what you think the price would have been had you waited and purchased at maturity rather than locked in the price today. Right, so that is the reason, because there are more hedging producers than there are speculators willing to go long, that's the reason, under this theory, that commodity returns have been so strong, right? Because speculators have been in the minority, so they've been able to negotiate a low locked-in futures price. 
And that low locked-in futures price is what's producing these strong commodity returns. The reverse occurs if the market's in contango. Right? It's rare, but what happens is that essentially here the hedges flip to the consumer side. Right? This happened in 05 when there was things like the Iraq War and Hurricane Katrina, and that uh, made the oil price very volatile. So what happens there is it's the consumers that are the ones that need to hedge their risk. The consumers want to hedge by going into a long position. They need to persuade speculators to go short. And the way they do that is, okay, speculators, you're going to lock in a price that I pay you. Let me raise that price above what we expect the future spot price to be. You benefit by receiving more. I benefit by hedging away the risk. It's rare, but it can happen. Now, in that market, the